Well, I'm Phil Sakowitz. I'm the AUSA Chair for the Army Civilian Advisory Committee. And uh, on behalf of General Gordon Sullivan, President of AUSA and Council of Trustees, I welcome you to the 2013 Army Civilian Professional Development Seminar. Thank you for coming. As you know, AUSA supports the Army Civilian Corps as they are a very integral part of our Army team. I will now introduce Mr. Jay Aronowitz. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Whoa. Got a little quiet there, so I woke everybody up. Well, I'm Phil Sakowitz. I'm the AUSA chair for the Army Civilian Advisory Committee. And uh, on behalf of General Gordon Sullivan, President of AUSA and Council of Trustees, I welcome you to the 2013 Army Civilian Professional Development Seminar. Thank you for coming. As you know, AUSA supports the Army Civilian Corps as they are a very integral part of our Army team. I will now introduce Mr. Jay Aronowitz, Assistant G1 for Civilian Personnel Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff of G1. Jay. Thank you very much, uh, Phil, for, uh, for that introduction. Um, you know, I've known Phil, <coughs> excuse me, Sackowitz for a number of years, <coughs> and, and he and I uh, have been trying to figure out if, if somehow we're related, Jay Aronowitz and, and, and Phil Sackowitz, and uh, probably uh, as our families crossed Ellis Island somewhere, there was a, a, a split. Uh, he stayed north, and my family ended up going south. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2013 AUSA Civilian Professional Development Seminar. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, and a very dear friend of mine, General Vi. General Vi is the 18th commanding general of uh, the U.S. Army Material Command, one of the largest commands in the United States Army, with a presence in all 50 states and 144 countries around the world. If a soldier shoots it, drives it, flies it, wears it, communicates with it, or eats it, the Army Material Command provides it, giving our nation's war fighters the decisive edge whenever and wherever they're needed. A native of Martinsville, Virginia, General Vi was first commissioned as a Signal Corps officer after graduating as a distinguished military graduate from Virginia State University. He went on to earn a master's degree from Boston University and graduated from the Army Command General Staff College and the Army War College. He has held a variety of critical command and staff assignments to include recent responsibility for the task force in Southwest Asia that removed the U.S. military's equipment from Iraq at the conclusion of operations. He has commanded units in the 82nd Airborne Division and in the 3rd Armored Corps and served as a principal director on the joint staff in the Pentagon. General Vi is married to the former Linda Brown of Warsaw, Virginia, and they have two sons, Brian and Bradley. General Vi also holds the unique distinction of being the only Signal Corps officer in U.S. Army history to achieve the rank of four-star general, uh, a, a record that, uh, last check, I think 238 years uh, <laughs> and, and, and counting. Um, and, and not to disparage the Signal Corps, it may be another 238 <laughs> years before a Signal Corps officer is promoted to, uh, to four-star. Uh, again, uh, please join me in welcoming General Dennis Vi. See, I don't know whether to say amen or hallelujah. 
After that great introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, this is the time of AUSA where you're running on coffee and fumes. If you've had a busy week like I have, but what a great week because this is one of the uh, forums that we look forward to because it presents us an opportunity to engage industry professional development for our officers, non-commissioned officers and soldiers who can attend, but especially for our civilians. And so I'm deeply, deeply honored, and I thank Jay again for that uh, very kind introduction. I know we had uh, quite a few other folks who were going to be here this morning. I think uh, Guy Swan was held up, and he was not able to be here, but to Phil, thank you very much again. Uh, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to address such a large gathering uh, from our Army's Professional Civilian Corps. And I commend all of you for attending, because I know it's been a busy week for you. And there are many other places you could have been this morning. Uh, you decided to be here. And I think this is, and I believe this is, one of the most important forums during AUS AUSA. So I commend you. Um, to all the ladies and gentlemen, uh, the members of the Distinguished uh, Civilian Service, Executive Service, other distinguished guests, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to recognize some other outstanding leaders and teammates here. Lieutenant General Tom Bostic. Chief of Engineers. Tom, it's great to have you here. Uh -huh. One of my great battle buddies uh, also, and another great battle buddy that I've known probably from my days in the 82nd Airborne Division when we used to jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Still dreaming and wishing we could still do so today. <laughs> and that's Lieutenant General Mike Farida, Commander MCOM. Uh -huh. And certainly not least, uh, one of my uh, deputies in the Army Material Command and what I consider to be the premier uh, example of a member of the Senior Executive Service. And I don't say that because he just happens to be part of AMC, but John and I arrived at, JMC, uh, at AMC uh, right at about the same time, about a month between. I, I did not know John Nerger before then. We went to lunch, and I said, I like this guy. Uh, never knowing at that point in time I'd be the commanding general, and I can tell you he's one of our tremendous, tremendous teammates. John Nerger, it's great to have you here, John, be part of this panel. <laughs> and again, I appreciate uh, all of you taking time out of your schedules to be part of this panel today. I know it's going to be very, very important. In a moment, uh, I'll pass along a few thoughts uh, that you might consider doing your panels. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say thank you. Thank all of you for what you do every day for our soldiers. Having been the uh, commanding general of the Army Material Command now for uh, about 14 months and about 16 months as the deputy commander before, and of course uh, through assignments in the Pentagon from the time I was a major. Um, and our organization today at AMC, we're 96% civilian. So I know firsthand, I've got an inside view I think of the critical role that our civilian employees play every day in support of our Army. Nearly uh, one in every four Army civilians work at AMC. And so I'm enormously proud of what you do every day. And I want to thank you because I know this has been a challenging year. And I appreciate all that you've done. And I'm going to ask everyone else to join me in recognizing our great civilians, please. And I know you hear that phrase a lot, thank you, but I sincerely mean that. And I know the, the gentleman on this panel today, uh, the general officers here, and all of our senior leaders and our soldiers, we thank you for what you do every day. Wherever you find soldiers, you'll find civilians nearby. That's why you, when you walk into AMC's headquarters in Huntsville and uh, Redstone Arsenal, you'll notice two creeds. On one side of the entrance door is a soldier's creed. And on the other side is the civilian creed. We want everyone at AMC and everyone who visits AMC to know that our soldiers and civilians share the same values, the same mission, and that they serve shoulder to shoulder whenever and wherever our nation calls them to serve. We are, in fact, one team, one inseparable team. I've had the privilege of seeing our Army civilians in action across our nation, in big cities and in small towns, in factories and laboratories, 
in austere locations, very austere locations, and most notably providing direct support on the battlefield in the combat zone where we have soldiers, the civilians are right there beside them. And I've always been enormously impressed by their professionalism, their skills, their experience, their commitment, their patriotism, and most of all, their willingness to serve. So when your first panel discusses, when this panel this morning discusses the contributions civilians have made and continue to make their Army, there are a few places and a few professionals I want you to keep in mind. Our organic industrial base, which I've referred to often as a national treasure, is operated by specialized artisans with skill sets that in many cases do not exist anywhere else in the United States, and in some cases do not exist anywhere else in the world. Last year I visited Waterville Arsenal in New York, which is the sole producer of cannon tubes for the entire, not just the, uh, the Army, but the entire military. They've been making cannons there since, since the War of 1812. And when I was there, I met an amazing machinist by the name of Mr. Ryan Putnam. He has more than 20,000 hours of experience. Ryan is so skilled that he can straighten the cannon tubes by listening to the sound they make when pressed with up to 900 tons of pressure. He has an automated device that he can use to check, but he uses his ear. And while we're all wondering when that cannon tube is going to break, he said, don't worry, General, I got this. And right away, he's doing that. That level of experience is nearly irreplaceable. At the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant, I met a lady by the name of Miss Lisa Dutton. She's a quality assurance specialist. One of her responsibilities is to provide oversight of the production of 40 millimeter high explosive dual purpose ammunition. Go ask any soldier in Afghanistan how valuable these are in combat. Miss Lisa Dutton provides that capability every day and I was proud to shake her hand. And down at Anderson Army Depot in Alabama, where the workforce calls itself the pit crew of the American warfighter. They're providing just that as a pit crew follows the driver on the racetrack. Our Army civilians follow the warfighter to the battlefield. In fact, approximately 85% of all deployed DOD civilian personnel are Army civilians. And approximately half of those come from the Army Materiel Command. And when civilians deploy, they usually don't have the same support systems available to our soldiers. There are people like Mr. Keith Rainwater, a heavy mobile equipment repairer who just returned from a 23-month deployment to Afghanistan. He served as a field service representative for the assault breacher vehicle that was built in Anderson. Mr. Devin Cowens, also a certified machinist, he deployed earlier this year to the Mobile Parts Hospital in Kuwait. That's a production facility for parts and tools that don't, that the units don't have, can't get, and in some cases don't even exist. They take a drawing and they produce it and deliver it to the warfighter. They've been in Iraq, they've been in Kuwait, they've been in Afghanistan, they're in Afghanistan today. Devin was joined by his fellow machinist, Mr. Health, Mr. Heath Carr. The two help provide soldiers in theater unique capability of being able to produce parts and tools to fix something on the spot. And Mr. John Clark, a small arms repairer in Anderson, was recently awarded the non-Article 5 NATO medal for his service repairing M2A1 machine guns while deployed to Afghanistan. And just as our soldiers and their families have sacrificed, so too have our civilians and their families. Since the wars began in Afghanistan and Iraq, 15 Army civilians have lost their lives serving alongside our warfighters. One of those was Miss Linda Villar, an AMC employee. She volunteered to deploy to Iraq in 2005 and served as the Chief of the 3rd Infantry Division Logistics Support Element. Linda was tragically killed in a mortar attack in Baghdad on June 3, 2005, 
A few months later, a gate was dedicated in her honor at Logistics Support Area or LSA Anaconda. And our main conference room at AMC headquarters is named in her honor as well. The same values, the same mission, the same team, one team, providing essential support and serving shoulder to shoulder with our warfighters. And I couldn't be more proud of them all. Every time I see them, I'm always we could become energized in the great work that they do every day. Along with our technicians and artisans, AMC has more than 14,000 scientists and engineers. They have helped Army become a world leader in basic scientific research and applied technology. In areas like armaments, life-saving medical advances, nanotechnology, robotics, fuel-efficient initiatives, and simulation. For instance, Mr. Christopher Hurley it is, is an electronics engineer at CECON, the Communication Electronics Research Development Engineering Center, or CERDEC, in APG, Maryland. Hurley's team aims to develop smaller, lighter, cost-effective power sources for our soldiers. One of his projects is the CWB, the Conformal Wearable Battery. It provides more power reduces the need for battery recharging, and serves as a single source of power for all the electronic devices worn by the warfighter. It's also flexible and integrates into body armor. There's no doubt this technology will save lives. And then there's Miss Cindy Learn, a systems engineer at Edwood Chemical Biological Center in Maryland. She works on the hard-to-fit mask program that accommodates members of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, along with all DOD civilians who are required to wear a mask. Warfighters cannot deploy without properly fitting, fitted uh, masks, and it's Cindy's job to make sure that nobody's left unprotected. Her colleague at, at Edgewater is Mr. Alan Samuels, a research chemist. And like many of our civilians, he serves in the Army Reserve as a lieutenant colonel. Last year, the White House honored Allen as a champion of change for his work while deployed to the RDCOM Field Assistance in Science and Technology Center in Afghanistan. He researched the effectiveness of microgrid technology to more effectively use energy in a combat environment and observed a 17% reduction in fuel usage Saving fuel not only saves money, but it also saves lives. In 2011, the Army G4 office estimated that 18% of U.S. casualties in Afghanistan and Iraq were related to ground resupply. Clearly, research by Army civilians like Alan Samuels will save lives in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your Army civilians. They are my Army civilians. And simply put, our Army and the entire Joint Force, for that matter, couldn't accomplish this mission without them, without you. And to everyone in this room, I'm truly grateful for what you do every day, for your leadership, for your service, for your commitment, for your dedication, and for your sacrifice. Now, those of you here this morning don't need me to remind you that the past year has been challenging for our Army and especially our Army civilians. Pay freezes, hiring freezes, budget reductions, the sequester, sequestration, furloughs, and then, of course, the year-end closeout, which we're able to accomplish, and then here comes the government shutdown. Uncertainty is the new watchword. I am encouraged, however, because I know our Army civilians I know them, and I know that regardless of what comes next, we've been there before and with and through their outstanding leadership and commitment, we'll make it through. Oftentimes in crisis, there is opportunity. In uncertainty, there's opportunity. We just have to look a little harder. A famous quote by Winston Churchill, gentlemen, we're out of money, now we have to think. So as we decrease the number of soldiers, we're also going to decrease the number 
of support personnel. That's no doubt about that. It happens after every war. But my message to you today is to look at this challenge as an opportunity, an opportunity to responsibly reshape our Army for 2020 and beyond. We have to be creative. We have to be innovative. We have to be bold and visionary. We must offer those innovative solutions that in the past met resistance. Now's the time to think out of the box, truly think out of the box. So please allow me to share a few ideas that perhaps you can discuss today. As you know, we must responsibly rebalance the workforce in the coming years. The voluntary separation incentive payments, VIRA and VSIP, were set at $25,000 in 1994. That would be about $40,000 in today's dollars. Should these be increased? Maybe set at a higher rate at the beginning of the year and decreased as, it, as the year passes, incentivizing employees to transition sooner. Maybe we can consider removing organizational impediments to part-time labor so employees can finish their careers in a part-time status. Some senior employees are okay with a three or four day work week. So should we allow employees to buy retirement credit in order to meet minimum qualifications sooner? In the industrial workforce, we're exploring a generic industrial worker position description, which would allow flexibility in moving employees across production lines to reduce layoffs and skill imbalances. Should the rest of the workforce look at multifunctional PDs? I don't know. Perhaps that's something you can talk about and think about today. Meanwhile, about 25% of our workforce but will be retirement eligible in FY 15, 2015. So we must recruit and retain young talent. We, what can be done to improve our intern fellowship and pathway programs? They are the seed corn for our future. Mr. Nurger started off as an intern. Bobby Turzak started out as an intern. How do we grow the next John Nurger? How do we make sure we're bringing in bright folks who continue to serve our nation and replace us when we leave? Should they only be offered if they offered opportunities if vacancies have been identified in which they could flow after their internship? Or are there other options we can consider for these programs? And how do we make government service more attractive to the younger generation, especially during this time of uncertainty? How do we communicate with them? I often say if I call our son, who's now a senior in college and we have a senior in high school, I can pull my iPhone out and call and they will not answer the phone. <laughs> I can ring again, they still won't answer the phone. I can send a text, bam, hits right back at me. Because they live in a text world. So how do we communicate to that new generation out there to let them know about service in our Army? How do we let them know about career opportunities to grow these scientists and engineers and all these other positions that we have across our force? How do we communicate with them? So again, maybe that's something to think about today. And then as we reshape our civilian workforce, there are some, is there some way to protect our interns and our younger workers uh, for, from potential reductions in force? How do we keep them and be able to allow to build that bench for tomorrow. And in terms of workforce development, there's been a lot of discussion about allowing federal sabbaticals, similar to the military's training with industry program. What would happen if we expand the TWI program to allow a one-year, no-cost TWI opportunities for DOD employees? Again, something to think about. I think we also need to devise creative ways to improve our civilian education system. Maybe by using more mobile training teams or mentorship and temporary developmental programs, all very beneficial. Also, should we create more certification programs that allow movement between government and non-government jobs as part of our development? And I think we also need to, most importantly, incorporate ideas and programs to take better care of our people. A recent report showed that 86% of employees don't participate in our wellness initiatives because they say they don't have the time. 
We have to do better. We have to maintain a resilient and ready workforce. And the civilians, DOD civilians, are a critical component of their workforce. I'm proud to say that the American Heart Association awarded headquarters AMC its Gold Level Fit Friendly Worksite Award. So how can we spread these efforts and get more workers and supervisors to join and support them? Frankly, I don't know the answers to all of uh, these questions, but I do know the answers will come. The answers must come from our civilian corps, which is undoubtedly the most talented, experienced, and professional civilian corps in the history of the United States Army. We're looking to you to chart a path forward, transforming while taking care of people, and preserving our hard-won advancements. Lastly, for those who've served our Army for a few years, we've been through times like these before. And I encourage you to go out and talk to our young employees who have not been through this experience and explain to them and encourage them that it'll be okay. We'll make it through. And get some, and obtain some ideas from them and their thoughts. Great periods of transformation have always been challenging. There are always the pessimists who are always there to doubt our abilities and to doubt our resolve. But every time, every time in the 33 years I've been wearing the uniform of a United States soldier, our Army and our nation emerged stronger than before. Again, thank you for allowing me a few moments this morning to share a few thoughts with you. You have my sincere gratitude for everything that you and the rest of our great Army civilians do every day for our Army, for our Joint Warfighters, and for their families. I wish you only the very, very best doing this important seminar, and I look forward to the great outcomes I'm sure it will produce. Thank you for all you do to keep our Army, Army strong. May God continue to bless our great soldiers, those who are deployed in harm's way, our great Army civilians, and our contractor teammates and their families. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Sir, th thank you very much for those inspiring and informative comments about our Army civilians, but also particularly your guidance for what we should do and what we should take from here. That's exactly what this uh, professional development seminar is supposed to do. You gave us those ideas. And now, on behalf of AUSA, I'd like to give you this world-famous, highly coveted 2013 annual meeting pamphlet on behalf of uh, General Sullivan and everyone. Th we're staying inside the ethics rules here. And so, uh, sir, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I was getting ready to say I have a collective series ongoing today, so I appreciate it very much. Have a good day. What a great start, huh? Okay, again, I'm uh, Phil Sackowitz, uh, chair of the Army Civilian Advisory Committee for AUSA, and proud to say a U.S. Army retired civilian, still serving in various capacities, as many of you are out there, and uh, happy to be here. I also, again, want to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful professional development. Thank you for coming. Um, usually that's kind of a, a routine comment, but obviously given the challenges that General V talked about, General Vi, excuse me, talked about, um, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. It's a wonderful turnout. It continues to increase each year. I appreciate you doing it, especially given the times. And heck, I, I know all about it too, um, because I didn't arrive till late last night. I was supposed to be here all week, and I can tell you that the reach of the government budget woes uh, has made it to the industry, um, and I can attest to that. It has reached the number one brand in the world, Coca-Cola. <laughs> so uh, I, was, uh, I was told to stay behind and uh, talk about what we're doing with the military, and I assure you we'll continue to do things, but other companies do now. I'm not here to talk about Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, only an example of how the kinds of things that are happening to you also 
reflect on what's going on in the industry too and it's a perfect time because a usa brings the industry and the military together to try to solve these problems and so this is a perfect time to do that uh... this time i also want to introduce my my battle buddy for a usa tony wainwright um, retired ses and and your a usa senior fellow on army civilian affairs some things never change i was following tony for about thirty years she's still leading me um, and I m love that. Okay, um, we're going to have two exciting panels today. Of course, we strive to give you the most informative information, and I, I'm sure we will accomplish that today. Uh, each panel member will present their results. We have two panels today. Upon the completion of each panel, you will have opportunity to answer questions. To handle the questions, you have in your seats uh, some of those index cards. Uh, when you have a question at any time, please hold it up. Tony and Barbara Heffernan are going to come by and pick them up, and then we will ask the questions at the conclusion of all the remarks by our three panelists. The first panel today will discuss civilian contributions in a time of change. The members of this panel are Lieutenant General Thomas Bostick, U.S. Army Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Lieutenant Ger General Michael Farrader, Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management and Commanding General of the United States Army Installation Management Command, and Mr. John Nerger, Executive Deputy to the Commanding General of the Army Materiel Command. We begin this morning's first panel with Lieutenant General Bostic. In 2012, General Bostic became the 53rd U.S. Army Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. In this position, he is responsible for more than 37,000 civilian employees and 600 military personnel who provide project management and construction support to 250 Army and Air Force installations in more than 100 countries around the world. Let's give a warm welcome to General Bostic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Phil. I appreciate that kind of introduction. It's great to be back uh, with a lot of uh, friends in the personnel community and, and also with, within USACE. Um, I, I get a lot of help from my USACE teammates. So I just wanted to recognize them, those that are here. If you could just stand up and, and be recognized uh, that, that work with me. Yeah. It's a great team. Okay. They're here to make sure I say everything correctly. <laughs> You know, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background um, on my experience uh, with uh, civilians, and, and I'm going to focus on leader development. That's what they asked me to do. Um, you know, I've been in the Army all my life. My dad was a Master Sergeant in the Army. He spent 26 and a half years in. Um, I'm now at 35, and I feel like he got out early. Um, <laughs> but um, I never met my civ a civilian until I, I came to Washington. I was selected to be the XO to the chief engineers, I was a young major, and I came into Washington, D.C., and being a, a leader, uh, the first thing I started doing was giving orders, and I, I realized that I was probably the most junior person around, <laughs> so, so no one listened to the, the orders. <laughs> and then I, I decided to make PT mandatory. So um, first, mor first morning I showed up, and uh, I was the only one in formation. <laughs> so uh, I realized that something was different. Uh, and despite our differences, I learned through deployments in Bosnia and Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in, in a real battle zone inside the Beltway in the Pentagon, that civilians are, are a real part of this team, uh, a true part of this team that we could not succeed without. Uh, we often talk uh, about how many soldiers we have, we, we, you know, 1.1 uh, 1 million soldiers. But amongst those 1.1 million soldiers, there are 315,000 civilians. And those 315,000 civilians, a huge part of our total force, make a tremendous difference in our success uh, each and every day. Um, I saw it uh, up close and personal, even in combat, um, where um, we, we also talk about 1.1 million soldiers that have deployed in return. But we often don't talk about the 35,000 or 30,000 or so civilians, uh, go government civilians that have deployed and returned and, and served in harm's way, as General Vi had talked about. 11,000 have been USA civilians, so I'm really proud of the USA civilians that, that answer the sound of the gun. You know, the personnel business, I, 
you know, I, I was former G1, so I, uh, so I got a taste of what that, that's like, and, and I realize it's pretty tough business. So for all of those that are in the HR world, uh, thanks for what you do. I, uh, when, when I first became the G1, the, the chief told me to go out and survey the force and travel around and see how the, the S1s of the world are doing, the folks in the personnel business. And I came back and I said, well, uh, let me summarize it like this. The folks in the personnel business um, are out there afraid of being fired. And if they're not afraid of being fired, that's because they've already been fired. And uh, those that have been fired have been rehired because nobody wants a job. Uh, it, it, and it's not really that bad, but it sometimes is close. Uh, we just went through this furlough, as you all know, and government shutdown. And I think the, the group in our headquarters that took the biggest beating uh, from all of that was our HR folks, because they're, they're the message deliverers. And uh, so my hat's off to all of those that, that work in this very difficult uh, and challenging, but, but, but most rewarding business of, of managing our human capital. In addition to those that have deployed overseas, um, we have had uh, many of our USACE teammates deploy in, in country here, in, in helping their fellow Americans, whether it was Hurricane Isaac, uh, Superstorm Sandy last year, and we had a drought on the Mississippi that was pretty intense for us. But what I found is civilians answer the sound of the guns just like soldiers. I mean, whether it was Thanksgiving or Christmas, they packed up their bags, they left their families, uh, they deployed and, and they served, whether that was overseas or whether it was here helping their fellow Americans. Uh, what we hadn't done over the years is invest in our civilians' uh, development and career programs. And I was fortunate to be there with Carl uh, Schneider and um, Secretary Lamont and, and the G1 team when uh, Dr. Westfall, he was here and I came to one of his uh, talks about three or four years ago when he spoke to this audience and he talked about civilian workforce transformation. I think you remember that. Um, and there was a lot of talk about it, but there was no money. And talk without no money is n just talk. And, uh, but it was Dr. Westfall who, in the POM process, decided we we're going to put $4 million to kind of start the process of civilian workforce transformation, which is really uh, looking at everyone's career and mapping out that career uh, and understanding recruiting, retention, and development throughout uh, the human life cycle. So credit to, to the undersecretary. And he said we're going to do it for 100% of the force. And, uh, and I will tell you, as a G1, I said, I didn't think that was right. And, and he says, well, thanks for your interest in national security. We're going to do it for 100% of the force. <laughs> so I saluted, and we drove on. And, and he was right. It was the absolute right thing to do. And, and I think we've come a long way. Um, in my own organization, uh, I'm responsible for um, the Career Program 18, which is all of your, your scientists and your engineers. And we're the proponency for that. And we've been doing it on a sh shoestring budget. We have two people working that, but because of this funding I've talked about and the commitment of the Army, we're moving from two, f two civilians that are running our career program to 12 people. And we'll have those 12 people in place this year, and they will manage the careers of 26,000 uh, civilians that are in career program 18 for the entire Army. So, so that's a huge commitment, I think, from the Army and, and as we say, talking ain't fighting, but we're fighting now that we've put resources against it. Uh, so recruit, retain, and develop. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about each one of those areas, highlight what we're doing in the core as perhaps something we can talk about. We're not, we're not perfect. We've got a lot of issues that we're, we're, we're getting off the ground. But, but the thing I found in the core is that the, the whole leader development has been in our DNA uh, in the Corps well before I arrived. It was a, it was a pleasant surprise for me, in fact, uh, having been the G1, uh, that this is something they, they do, and they do it regularly, and they do it everywhere throughout the organization. So first, uh, with recruiting, um, we have what's called the bathtub effect going on uh, in, in the Corps. We, we have about 40% of the folks that we have are like nine years or less. And then we've got about 40% of the folks we have are about 20 years or more. And then about, you know, the rest of it, that 20% is right in the middle. It's our mid-career uh, 
for civilians. And it really reminds me of when I came into the G1. And, uh, uh, General Casey said, okay, your first task is to fix the problem we have with majors. He said, uh, you go fix that, come back and tell me how you're gonna fix it. And I went and I looked at the problem and I came back I, and I said, okay, sir, I, I got the answer. And he said, so, so when are we gonna have this fixed? I said, not a problem, sir. It's all gonna be fixed in 2023. 2023? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I mean, we grow our leaders. I mean, I can't go hire them, so we grow our leaders. And it's going to take us that long to fix it because we, we, we cut off the spigot at, at, at the front end and we didn't bring people in. So uh, that stuck with me. And, and we still haven't fixed it. I, I mean, it's, you know, the only thing that's fixing it is we're drawing down the Army. But, but on the civilian side, you could say, well, I can hire laterally. And that's true. But if you need the experience of someone that has deployed as a civilian, if you need the experience of someone that has worked on a lock and dam for 10 years, uh, and if you need the experience of someone that has responded to Superstorm Sandy, um, you can't just hire that off the street. So a certain percentage of our force, uh, we can hire right off, off the street, but, but we need to grow. We need to bring in young men and women uh, right out of college or out of high school and serve with the Corps, just like we bring in uh, lieutenants. Um, and so part of my concern is really the youngsters. How, how do we bring in interns and young people uh, and make sure that they stick with us. The other thing I'd say is uh, the technical talent that we need is significant. And we focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. We believe we need to be part of the leadership of the nation in that regard. Um, out of 100 uh, college graduates, only four will be engineers. Four. Uh, we're in the bottom 14 in the world. We're down there with uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Cuba. Uh, those are our partners in terms of producing engineers in this country. And it's not much better when you look at diversity. Um, out of 100 college engineer graduates, 10 will be women, five will be African American, and five will be Hispanic. So we got a lot of work. Uh, we talk about diversity in the Army and, and the strength. I, I mean, this is a diverse crowd, it, you, know, you know, except for having a few more soldiers in here. This is a pretty diverse crowd. And, and it takes that diversity to come up with the kind of solutions that we really need to be a powerful organization that represents our country. So I even in the core, we have a tough time with this, and, and we've got to, to work it. In 2020, which is not too far from now, there will be 2.8 million STEM job openings. And at the current rate we're at, we need a million more. There will be a million openings uh, that are not filled at the current rate. And I told you how we're doing in terms of graduation. So, so, so this is a significant issue. And you'll see it uh, affecting organizations all throughout the United States. You don't, we don't feel it now in the Corps of Engineers, uh, but I'm convinced that, that, that we will. So we've got a lot of work to do just in the recruiting end of things. Now, retention. Uh, some of the good news on retention, and this is why I love the, the intern program. Uh, we are very aggressively pursuing interns. Uh, my G1 team, I see some of them here, uh, former G1 team that are here. And, and, and interns, I, I know we have to pay for it, but it's a tremendous program. Uh, we retain about 60% of the interns in the Corps of Engineers, so we're very, very happy about that. Six of our SESs, we have 43 SESs. I, I know folks are probably feeling that's a lot. But, but we have 43 SESs, six of them went through the intern program. And so 15%, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good return on that investment. Um, I wanna talk about uh, now uh, a little bit about leader development. And again, this is in the DNA of the core. And, and I credit the people that went w before me. Uh, normally when I, if you talk to a district commander or a division commander, they can tell you who's been through their intern program or, or their leader development program. It's by name, they can tell you. When I show up, they want me to talk. They've got intern or leader development program sessions, lunch, brown bag lunches. They want me to come and speak to those folks. And we focus on uh, several things. Uh, leader, leaders that can lead change, uh, leaders that can lead people, uh, results uh, driven uh, uh, leaders, uh, leaders that understand business. Uh, they understand the money side of things and they understand how to build coalitions, and they work on enterprise solutions. So, so th those are qualities 
of any great leader, but, but we specifically focus on those. And you progress in our leader development program from the regional level to the division level uh, to the national level. Uh, the, w we, we'll let our leaders go to other organizations. We, we don't mind that. We, we like to keep a lot of them inside, but, but if they have to go outside, uh, we, we'll do that. You know, one of them, you, you may know, one of, one of our SES is uh, Christine Altendorf. She's in charge of all our environmental programs. And um, when the secretary and the chief asked for her to take over the SHARP program, um, I can't say that I just jumped at it, but, but I didn't jump backwards. You know, you know, I went forward and I said, this is the right thing to do for, for the Army, and, uh, and she's over there. And uh, Gwen DeFilippi isn't here, but I haven't had her backfield yet. So, uh, but we're, 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 we know that we're doing a great thing by letting her out. And she's gonna come back to us a much stronger individual having been experienced in the ways of the Pentagon, Congress, and other things. Uh, so, so we focused in our leader development program in three years, education, developmental assignments, like I just talked about uh, with Christine Altendorf and, and mentoring. Um, the education is, is a lot fairly similar to what, what uh, most of the Army does at the senior levels. Uh, our developmental assignments are, are within the organization or outside. Right now I have Kelly Barnes who works with, um, or down at Fort Belvoir normally, but she's in my headquarters working for 30 days, helping me to get through the day-to-day -day business and long-term efforts of what we do. And it's an eye-opener for her and it's an eye-opener for me, but I can tell you within a week, she's, she's hitting home runs and she's making a difference for our team. So, so it doesn't have to cost much is what I'm saying. We can do leader development uh, in, in, a, in a way that will broaden leaders, give them experiences uh, that they would not otherwise have without a, a, a significant amount of effort. Um, we have a, a strong mentoring program. It's a one-year commitment. We, we do a 360 on both the protege and the ment mentor, and we match them up. It's a two-day conference where they bring them, I shouldn't say conference, two-day uh, gathering where we bring them together. <laughs> two, yeah, two-day gathering where we bring them together, and, uh, and it's done locally, so, so it's not, it's not cost, costly. But, uh, we bring them together, and, and it's, they sign a, a memorandum of agreement, and for a year they decide what they're going to do together. And, and this mentoring may go on for a longer period of time. In many cases it does. But uh, in, in the funding is, is done centrally by the headquarters, so we, we make a commitment to do this. Um, examples at the higher level is our senior uh, leader conference, or our emerging, in addition to our senior leaders conference, we have a parallel Emerging Leaders Conference, where we bring in uh, young uh, GS uh, 9s to 12s from all over the country. They come and they, they shadow one of the senior leaders. So I have a, a, a shadow that, that works with me through that, that conference for three or four days, and then we stay in touch afterwards. Uh, so, so it's a great opportunity for them. Um, the other example I wanted to talk about is our, our professional and technical development programs. We, we really encourage the professionalism. If you're an engineer, we want you to have your professional engineer license. If you're work, working in program management, we'd like you to have your program management certification. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're in IT or you're in supply, in logistics, um, uh, public affairs, if there's a certification involved, we are a profession and we want you to have your professional certifications and licensings, and we will pay for it, and we will give you the time to do that. And, and when it happens, then I write a personal handwritten note to, to just say thanks for taking the time to go out and, and do that. And it's been a great program. Uh, uh, the other program I want to talk about is our Planning Associates program. And, and this is an effort to broaden the competencies of our, again, our, our leaders in the GS 11 and 12. It's 20 weeks of rigorous training. It's scheduled in one to three week blocks. It's all throughout the country. So you're learning business. Uh, you're learning about our inland waterways. You're learning about um, our research and development. You're learning how to operate at a headquarters. Um, and, and, and all of those experiences are investments in our people that we believe uh, and we know will pay dividends down the road. I thought I'd just close with uh, uh, you know, something that one of our former chiefs of staff of the Army uh, often said. He, 
He said, uh, this was General Abrams, and he said that soldiers are not in the army. He said soldiers are the army. And I've used that same phrase for our civilians, that civilians aren't in the army. They, they really are the army. 30% of the army is our civilians. They, they are the army. And, uh, and I think it's so very important. And I, and I, I think the work of the, those that are in human resources is recognized throughout the world. And I, I give you this last example. The, the Chief Staff of, of Army, General Odierno, always has us uh, come together with different Chiefs of Staffs uh, of armies internationally. And I was in one with the Russian Chief of Staff. And I introduced myself. Uh, I didn't say the G1 because I, I didn't know if he'd know that in translation. So I said, I'm in charge of the people for the Army, soldiers and civilians. And he stood back and he said something in Russian. And then the translator said, you know, um, the chief of staff said, the only thing higher than the people that are in charge of people is the sun. I took that as a good comment, you know? <laughs> I mean, so, so you all that are involved in the people business, and I say that to everybody, because even if you're not involved in the people business, you're in charge of people, so you're taking care of people. So thanks for everything that you do. Uh, I'm happy to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Bosick, for all those comments. I appreciate it. Let me remind you about uh, questions. You can write them on the cards. Please send them to the middle. You've got Barbara standing in the middle. Tony's going to be walking around uh, to get them, and then we'll take some at, at the end of the panel. Okay, now we'll hear from General Ferreter. Uh, since two, November 2011, General Ferreter has been the United States Army Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management in the Pentagon and the Commanding General of the Installation Management Command at Joint Base San Antonio, Fort Sam, Houston, Texas. Incom is a $20 billion enterprise, $20 billion enterprise that provides world-class services and facilities at 75 Army posts across 17 time zones. Over 75,000 dedicated Incom soldiers, Army civilians, and contractors, and professionals who are supporting everyone who lives, works, and trains on Army installations. Let's please welcome General Ferreira. kind introduction again and uh, and it's really great to be on this panel with with Tom Bostick and and uh, with Mr. Nerger here and uh, um, it's it's especially great to be with John and and uh, Phil Sackwitz as they and so many of you in the room paved the way for Installation Management Command and the Office of the Accent and uh, and even the, the uh, Secretariat IE and E and uh, and you uh, your work and your professional approach built the culture that exists today in Installation Management Command. And it's a, it is a great day to be a soldier. And it's a, it, it's a great day to be an Army civilian. Whoa. And it's a great day, especially great to be here on this panel with all of you. Now, I'm really intimidated because I see what's really the Hall of Fame of, of uh, Army civilians in the room. <laughs> and I was supposed to tell you, you know, about developing civilians. Um, but I'm more intimidated because the mother of my first grandbaby is sitting in the first row, and Captain Mary Whitney's right here, and so she delivered a great little boy. And Parker uh, is our little five-month-old uh, grandbaby who's here with us this week, and Mary Whitney has served in the Army for about four-plus years and uh, ends her time in service shortly, and She'll go take on the world as, uh, as a civilian or an Army civilian, no doubt. And uh, I'm really proud of you. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm introduced today as, as the uh, AXIM Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management, uh, where I work in the Pentagon, and as the MCOM CG. Uh, and so the Commanding General of Installation Management Command in Joint Base San Antonio, as Phil said. And so, and we live here in town at Fort Myer, and I, on any given day, I'm either eight minutes from work or eight hours from work. But I'm also sitting here today uh, representing the Secretariat and ASA, uh, IE and E, Ms. Hammock, and her team and our team. And I'm also sitting here, as described uh, by Tom Bostick, 
um, representing my headquarters and all the great uh, folks from San Antonio, the region directors and uh, Dave Tyndall's here in the room, and uh, and the great team that, uh, that Dave and uh, leads and the region directors lead. And I'm also uh, sitting here um, representing every civilian who works for us at those 75 garrisons and installations around the world. And so I'm going to describe what we've done in the last uh, two years, which really was continue the journey of uh, professional development and students at these echelons. And so this awesome organization that we're all a part of that I'll describe to you, um, you know, w one day we're working nuclear fission and depleted uranium at a shooting range in Hawaii, and then the next briefer is talking about child development centers. And I said, are you kidding me? Nuclear fission and CDCs in, that, in the same cup of coffee? And that's how broad and wide and deep and great this, uh, this team is. Um, our, these civilians, our Army civilians, are masters of the art and the science of installation management. And our people at the garrisons are on point to help keep the Army strong. And uh, we once put a slide up that, uh, that showed fiscal constraints and, and uh, Christy Ham said, y you shouldn't say operating in, in a, in a fiscal, fiscally constrained environment, you should say keeping the Army strong. That's your job and your mission. And so we're all reminded that it, times will get a little tough, but the mission hasn't changed and we'll take care of business. You know, when you get your first impression of how well the Army takes care of people, starting at our front gate and our MCOM force protection professionals often are the face of the Army's commitment. In fact, they're ambassadors who say welcome home or rock of the Marne or climb the glory. Uh, that face of the installation professional greets you. Uh, we're in the Child Development Center. We uh, run the ID car office. We run the physical fitness centers and the housing office. And, uh, and we, we have done so much work. And so raise your hand if you've ever been in an Army housing office. Raise your hand if it was like going to Disney World. It was wonderful, yeah, because they're in charge of it, right? But it, it should be. We have the best housing the Army's ever had, and the customer service is the key to success because we wouldn't want to put $8 billion into something and have a pissed-off Army spouse, right? And so we have to retrain. We had to train everyone to say, no, no, you're here because they're going to come in that door. You know, and talk about incentives and, and, uh, and thinking differently as General Vi challenged us. You know, if, if you get 100% occupancy, um, then, you know, that's a good thing. That money is going back into the installation and all that. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't there be incentives for the housing office people that every time you put someone in the house, give them $50, give them $100, give them $200? Oh, no, we can't do that. But we should because that's what they're doing. They're making it better that way. Uh, when a soldier prepares to train, we give them a roll-on and roll-off capability. And, and uh, sometimes there's a little, you know, who's in charge of this? And we tell the commanders, uh, look, you can, you can get and you will get a predictable service. You get your soldiers there, you get your gear there, and it will be there for you. MCOM civilians are mission enablers and mission enhancers. They deliver the services that keep soldiers physically, mentally, and spiritually strong. The family and morale and welfare and rec programs are the foundation of a force that's ready and resilient. It's our people who make the Army installation platforms for readiness and resiliency. The soldier and family and youth activities are catalysts that create the well-being. Uh, uh, Tom Bosick and I both lived in Monterey, California. Uh, uh, we both grew up uh, in playing Little League on Army installations and posts. And my senior year, uh, his team beat us every single time. And so and I, I tell folks, they, they were the crosstown rivals that were too tough for us. But you, you make those bonds. And those kids, uh, and, and my kids who've grown up on, on Army installations, four great kids raised by Margie, and uh, you know they are now friends for life. And Facebook makes it even easier to stay connected when you're an Army brat. MCOM delivers those programs, that, and my professionals and our professionals at the installation uh, management team from the secretariat down to the garrison foster a collaborative culture of efficiency and responsiveness and effectiveness. And MCOM is, the is in the business of taking care of people. And in fact, we have uh, Career Program 27, 
that I'll describe in Career Program 29. At, um, and Career Program 29 has 63 occupational series who work in a variety of uh, management related positions. And we continually develop employees to achieve through training development assignments and mentorship, and I'll describe those to you in, in the next couple slides. And everyone in the M MCOM workforce is valuable. And I really appreciate, it as, uh, as you've heard so many times this week, to all our Army civilians uh, that you've, you've, you've stayed with us, you've, you've been told to go home, you've been told to come back, and, uh, and you, you've hung in there, and you inspire us all. And let's go to the next slide, please. As it came on board, uh, again, it, there's so many parallels in what General Bostic and I have said. You, um, we said, wow, this is going to be a little different than Overwatch support by fire, breach, and assault, in, uh, which an infantry guy normally does and, and, uh, and, a, and an engineer does as well. And, uh, and uh, how are we going to do this? And so the thought was we're going to do what, what we learned in the first three years of being uh, developed as leaders, and that is we're going to build teams, and we're going to build trust, and we're going to empower subordinates wherever we can. Sergeant Major Rice and I are standing there. Uh, we work together as a command team at Fort Benning, and I'm so blessed to have him come back and, uh, and join me for these last two years as well. Um, and then we're going to tell people, do your best and do what's right. And uh, we've lost so many senior leaders across the force for not doing what's right. And so be true to your spouse and leave everyone else alone is something that we say, right? <laughs> okay? That's a good thing, and that's the right thing. Okay, because it's divisive to your organization when they can't trust their leaders. Okay, and all the promises and all the demands that a leader puts on someone and then they can't even tell the truth. That's why we have to do what's right. We take care of people and say thank you often. You cannot say thank you too many times. It's too hard. And in our hallway, we decided in the Pentagon where everyone walks by each other without talking, that we were going to be the greeters. We were going to greet faster and better than anyone in the Pentagon. And so now, about 50 yards away, people are yelling at you so they can say it first, right? <laughs> but it changes the whole culture and demeanor of the day. Uh, demonstrate and develop the war ethos. Now, that, that probably came from time in troop units, but actually, it's I will never quit and I'll never leave a fallen comrade. And I'm going to take care of everyone. And so, you know, we, we have folks uh, whose moms get come down, they're ill, and then they get better. And uh, Russ, we're praying for you still. And Hugh, you know, we're watching you all the time, making sure, you know, we're getting those beats per minute and all that kind of stuff. So this is a, this is a living and breathing force that we have, and we have to take care of each other. And then finally, you know, all units have standards, but great units enforce the standards. And so developing the procedures and enforcing those in the way that we deliver services is what our workforce does, and that's what allowed us and permitted us to save $1.4 billion last year. $1.4 billion. Allowed us to reshape our workforce and take over 5,000 people off of the workforce or retrain without a riff. Okay? Because they're counseled, they're mentored, they're, they're given other opportunities, they're led. And then finally, it doesn't cost a penny to make someone feel like a million dollars. And so we should demonstrate inspired leadership every single day. Um, Army civilians are special. You know, you serve the country. You serve the men and women who serve the country. You serve the families who love and support the men and women who serve the country. We'll go to the next slide. So just quickly, as we went forward with maybe that philosophy, then we had to organize ourselves so that the workforce could see. So I'm sort of just telling you um, how we, we think we organized to provide purpose and direction. And you can see in there that uh, in the top 10, um, that the, the workforce, build the bench, use talent management, foster innovation and creativity. And you have to learn to say yes. If you want to empower or, or if you want to, uh, to um, foster creativity, when someone says, well, what do you think about, you have to say yes before they can finish the sentence. Because if you don't, then all, the, everything just gets to a log jam uh, to you. So finding a way, even when we're uh, tighter budgets, to foster that innovation has been. And then to have the best three-star headquarters and staff. Now, no offense to all the other three stars, it's not a competition, 
but we have to understand that as a headquarters in San Antonio, that you're not the biggest garrison staff in the world. You're not, you're not a replica of what happens at the garrison. You're operating between the region directors and those 75 installations and the Army headquarters and our peers and friends. And so that caused adjustment in the manner in which we operated. And then number nine, to run an enterprise, because if you get it right, if you train your, your folks and they deliver the service consistently, then you're going to run an enterprise. The soldiers and their families are going to get what they expect, um, and, and they'll be able to know what, they, what to expect. And, and guess what? You're going to run it a lot cheaper. We'll go to the next slide. So how do we do that? I'm just going to highlight these, these five uh, things that we did. And we're MCOM at 10, if, if you're not for sure. For 10 years, MCOM has been here. And we're here to stay. And, uh, and so this enterprise from the IENE to AXIM to MCOM with the regions and at the garrison really works well. And so let's talk about the academy. So if you're going to have standards and enforce standards, then you have to train and develop and teach those. And so each of our uh, directorates in the headquarters and every in each of the functional activities that we have uh, uh, down at the garrison are uh, now have a course. And so our leaders, uh, the directors of public works or the DHRs or the IG or the provost marshal, they come to this course and then uh, and they, they learn what the current standard is. And then their deputies come and then their young guns come. And so we're, we have professionalized this business of installation management. Um, we've, act, we've in essence developed the doctrine and the concepts to run the garrisons. We run a pre-command course for the commanders, command sergeants major and the deputies and of the garrisons. And, for, and, uh, and the course is attended by the headquarters folks from San Antonio as well as those from, from uh, AXIM and INE. And, and, uh, and we share the best practices. So really the comradeship that occurs by coming to the, to the academy is best practices are shared, friends are made, and, and uh, a walk across the street is to go find that paperwork that you sent to the headquarters that uh, you, you hadn't been able to get back. So the, the, the uh, academy's been a huge, huge success story. The next is talent management. And then in essence, uh, the point that I would make is we, we have a big talent, talent management. We offer career broadening experiences. We work on competencies and skills and abilities. And, uh, and we create a cadre of professionals. And we run a talent management executive council where the regional directors and the deputy commanding general uh, for support and uh, Joe Capps, my executive director, chair and look at those uh, up and coming and emerging leaders as, as uh, General Bostic described in his remarks. And then we have a headquarters uh, centralized mentoring program as well. And all of this really, and what was really neat, you talk about mentoring and teaching. I, I met Tony uh, Wainwright for the first time who said, I brought Karen Perkins up and, uh, and I'm watching Karen Perkins bring up dozens of, uh, of great young professionals. And so this, this idea of mentorship really works and, and thanks for what you did to make Karen so special for all of us. And so if you go to the next, we, I would uh, tell you also that we, we are very active also in this career program uh, 29 that we have proponency for, and it's a diverse workforce of our general scheduled uh, non and non-appropriate fund employees and foreign nationals and wage uh, system employees. And they, they are the ones who will look a young uh, Army spouse, a young soldier, or the children on our installations, they are the ones in that career program that uh, deliver the service. I'm very, very proud of them. It has 17,000 constituents identified. Um, and I think the most career programs ha average about 4,500. So career program 29 is, is a big, big program. And career program 27 on the next slide is, uh, is our housing. And again, as we professionalize our housing, then uh, um, we deliver the housing service, the unaccompanied housing, the Army family housing, and residential community initi initiatives through this. And uh, we, we, uh, we've developed this last year as well a virtual uh, housing capability. So you can be in, in uh, Graffenbeer knowing you're going to Fort Riley and you can actually look at the, the housing. And eventually we're gonna get to a point where you can select your house and take all that stress off if, uh, if a soldier wants to. 
and then finally the h r m b human resource management board you know we were we were all told that we're in a hiring freeze but all of us who are running organizations they're living and breathing organizations there needs to be a chance for promotion and growth and as well there needs to be a chance for keeping it keeping hiring young youngsters in there and keeping the organization alive and so in FY 12 we were able to really reshape if both in 12 and 13 as as we looked at our TDA's and we looked at what was the right size for our garrisons to be and using the voluntary separation incentive in Vera we were able to continue to hire and in fact we hired 2,200 in in 12 and about 4,000 this in 13 while our numbers came down over 500 below the end of year requirement and that a lot that in essence allows my leaders to see and pick and get to the right folks and it's been very very successful and then finally as we've all said go ahead and build this out real quick you know this is a people business so we're developing army civilians what we're really doing is we're building a team we're watching it grow and we're proud of it every single day and these are just a few there's officer McCoy that guy's so fired up that he makes Phil Sacklitz look boring and so you know he 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 if you go through his line at Fort Benning be ready because it's gonna take you about 10 minutes to get through there he's gonna ask you about your kids and your wife and you know what are you gonna do next week and and he's the one that really is mr. welcome home and and families will come back to Fort Benning and uh, he'll talk to him and all the guards there and uh, at most our installations I think is saying realize that they're the first personal touch of someone and and people will say my son's graduating from basic training today or my father's buried in the funeral in the uh, um, here in the cemetery and I why did how'd you know I was coming back why'd you say welcome home and we just say um, it you know an installation is home um, above or over in the far corner is Carol Pryor she's she's in survivor outreach services she's the blonde woman with the two children standing next to her um, we had we had a soldier who committed suicide and the father and the mother took it very very hard so she reached out as, as we're supposed to and uh, and the father was a Navy captain and he refused to talk to her she called uh, this this guy um, every month on the same day for 13 months same day 13 months at the 13th month he said it seems to me you're trying to help and uh, he was drinking heavily the family had split up and uh, and he was really destitute he's now on a chief of staff in the Army's advisory group he tells the chief survivor outreach saved my life I lost my son but it saved my life and she could have just booked it she could have just said hey action taken logged you know I tried I tried three months in a row but she never quit uh, down below is Rochelle Fletcher with a flag behind her uh, Rochelle works uh, um, also in uh, casualty notification and the like and um, and so a young youngster was killed over in uh, in Afghanistan vicinity from the 10th mountain so she went and uh, uh, helped the family out she found the father was living homeless so she went and she was able to get a, a suit so that the father could, could wear a suit at his son's funeral she found that the the wife was was estranged and uh, and the children were living in a hotel with the wife and she got Habitat for Humanity to build a home for for him yeah. And then uh, in the center is uh, our newest newest ones we just added, and that's Heather Roll and Micah Eckelt. And just two weeks ago, uh, in a CDC over in Germany in Wiesbaden, a child stopped breathing, and they they performed quick CPR and saved that child's life. And then my favorite story of all is uh, Jessica Zagalo. And Jessica is uh, in the far in the top left. Uh, Jessica is at Fort Bliss. She has about four children herself. Two little kids came in, um, needed foster home, so she's going to place them. She gives them a place for, gets them a place for night. She goes to her husband and says, "These two kids are darling. We got to take them into our house." And he, this young sergeant looked at his four kids and looked at her and said, "I'm not going to win this one, so sure." <laughs> so Jessica uh, goes in the next day and files. Now the children have since gone to a grandparent, um, but 
as the story uh, began, she cared enough to bring him into her home. Uh, these two little uh, fellows looked up at her the next day and said, Miss Jessica, what about Halloween? We want to go trick-or-treating. And she looked at her watch and she knew it was that Halloween had passed. And so she went to her neighbors in that Army housing area and she said, okay, Friday night's Halloween. Get your kids dressed up, remission the candy from last week. <laughs> Let's get ready. And so in a scene that probably looked like that thing from E.T. where they're walking around in the neighborhood, uh, Jessica walked those two little fellas around and they had Halloween. And, and uh, I think it's awesome. These are, these are who you are. These are who you lead. And uh, this is what we do. Go ahead and build. And so, you know, when you see that MCOM patch, you know, you should also think of Disney World because we create magic also. And those are the faces of our employees. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I'll be followed by John Nerger. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Furrer. Uh, again, questions anymore right to the middle, and we'll continue on. Um, next is Mr. John Nerger. Since uh, May 2011, John assumed the role of Executive Deputy to the Commanding General of the Army Materiel Command. As the Executive Deputy, he is responsible for material life cycle management, acquisition support, personnel and resource management, industrial base operation, enterprise integration, and provision of research and development, and science and technology for globally reaching command more than 70,000 personnel working worldwide, 155 locations globally and in 50 states. Please welcome Mr. Nerger. Well, well, Phil, thanks very much. I could have made it easy on you. All you really needed to say was that John Nerger is an Army civilian and he's proud of it. And uh, that would have been enough and all anyone in the room really needs to know. Now, I also know that having done this before, one of the things that panel chairs do up here is they, they sit and worry about the schedule and the time and how much longer uh, the panelists are going to speak. So I just want to put Phil's mind at ease and the rest of you as well. I've got about five minutes of, of uh, thoughts and comments about uh, furloughs. I want to talk a little bit about workforce reshaping, a little bit about leader development, a little bit about innovation. But before I do, I just have to tell you, if any of you are looking for uh, role models for leader development. If any of you are looking for what right looks like when it comes to leader attributes, you really don't have to look any farther than the gentleman here up here on this stage. And I just wanted to say in front of you that it's an honor to be up here uh, sitting with them on, on this panel. Um, and if, if what I'm about to say is just a little bit provocative, uh, that's okay. They're in, it's intended to be. Um, and let me first start by saying that uh, it's pretty, it's harder these days, isn't it, to, to be a public servant? Can I hear an amen? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, but, you know, it is harder. But I, I still have to tell you that I'm, I'm still so uh, uh, extremely proud to be an Army civilian because, you know, the, the best Army in the world needs the best possible support in the world, and that's what Army civilians do. Uh, and that's what continues to inspire me, it's what continues to motivate me, and, and it's what continues to reward me, even in, in the most difficult times. But it doesn't mean that I'm immune to, you know, many of the thoughts and, uh, and sentiments uh, by many of our civilians that, that have uh, occurred over the last year or so, particularly during the furloughs of FY13, exacerbated recently by actions associated with the, the government shutdown, causing civilians to you know, God forbid, even think of themselves when nothing further could be than the truth, uh, think of themselves as non-essential. And, you know, you can call a civilian anything, uh, but don't call them non-essential. I mean, that's absolutely the, the, the furthest that you could, uh, anything from the truth. Um, and, you know, even for an optimist like me, uh, you know, I don't want to dwell on these things, but we really should not shut them to the side either. We, uh, we, we really... Uh, need to need to talk about these things. I'm afraid that uh, the furloughs did much more than just uh, give civilians six unpaid days off. I mean, if it were only about the money, the civilians are ready to make the sacrifice. We know we have to sacrifice alongside with our military members and their families. And if it was only about the money, we'd say bring it on. But I'm worried that it's that that the impact is far more damaging than than uh, a loss of money in the paycheck. And as leaders, and there are a lot of leaders in this room, we, we need to acknowledge that and confront it. I'm troubled by how the, uh, the, those actions play into the popular mindset. 
that public service isn't valued and that, um, that absent government employees are not missed. Uh, evidence the, you know, some calling the government shutdown a government slim down. Um, I'm troubled by the loss of trust uh, in those loyal to an institution uh, who thought their service noble, meaningful, and a vocation, a calling. Um, and, we, we, and some of us heard General Sullivan talk about the theme of AUSA, trust, the bedrock of our profession. And I'm, I'm afraid that, that the, the, the bedrock was a little softer than it should have been uh, as a result of uh, um, uh, the, the, the furloughs and so on. I'm concerned that civilians will become less motivated uh, more discouraged and leave us, and, and there are signs that that is happening, and it's concerning me in AMC. Uh, we're losing senior scientists and engineers, and they're, they're sending us uh, the reasons why they're leaving, uh, and, and it's not encouraging. And, I, and worse, uh, I'm worried about uh, it deterring those um, who would otherwise be interested in joining our, our, our great team. I'm concerned what Army civilians think uh, when they don't hear leaders uh, uh, in DOD and the executive branch and the legislative branch speaking out loudly on behalf of, of uh, civilians. And I'm concerned when actions don't ma uh, match uh, uh, the words. Um, you know, we talk in the Army about, you know, if people are our credentials, furloughs certainly don't express it, do they? Uh, so I think we, get it, we need to all ask ourselves what we need to do to repair the damage and move forward, especially under conditions that are likely to persist or conditions that are likely to get worse. And as we look at um, uh, shaping the workforce, you know, now Army civilians face a very real prospect of workforce reductions. And on top of the things that other speakers and General Vi mentioned, uh, hiring freezes, pay freezes, incentive freezes, uh, increased uh, cost to you on on health care and, and retirement contributions. Now look, the budget's getting smaller, the Army's getting smaller, and, the, and so will the su civilian supporting force. It is a reality and we've got to deal with it. But as we go about it, I'm concerned we don't have the right tools uh, to shape the workforce without letting them go under less than pleasant uh, terms. Vera VSIP, in my estimation, as a bio tool is simply outmoded. Uh, it's become considered to be an entitlement for those who've already decided to leave. Uh, we need measures and incentives to entice those not quite ready to leave to make room for our younger workers. Uh, we need to be thinking, not, not just thinking, implementing measures like perhaps a, a percentage of salary, uh, a higher percentage in the first quarter, a lower percentage at the, the, the end of the FY as an incentive to to bring, get people off the rolls, or perhaps adding retirement year credits to, so that people can make that uh, calculation about, well, maybe I can leave a little bit earlier than I would have planned otherwise. Because we need ways to protect our interns. We need ways to protect our journeymen instead of those with longevity, like myself. And um, uh, as AMC reduces, I just don't see the ability uh, to do so in the manner that I'd like to, and I'm worried about that. We need to improve ex exit options. We need to allow part-time service, let's say not to exceed a year. I've got a sister-in-law that was able to do that working for the University of Illinois. She retired, she was able to come back, uh, work for no, no more than one year with no uh, impact to her retirement uh, uh, offset. So that she, that, that was an encouragement for her to, her to leave sooner than she would have otherwise as a means to transition sooner. Um, another thing that concerns me is uh, what it, this is all doing to our culture of innovation uh, among the workforce because uncertain times, uh, furloughs, downsizing, uh, I fear leads to risk averse behavior, uh, a near term focus rather than a long term focus, uh, reduced interest in professional development uh, and leader development and, and, a, and, and a weaker environment for the innovation that we need more now than, than we have uh, of late. And I'm concerned that when innovation isn't rewarded or incentivized, we get what we pay for, and it puts us on the road to mediocrity. Um, as far as workforce development is concerned, uh, you know, the, the leaders of IMCOM and, and USACE know well what happens when the Army fails to invest in its buildings and its infrastructure. I mean, they fall into costly disrepair, and they actually affect the mission of those that occupy those facilities. But a lack of investment in our human infrastructure, I think, is far more damaging long term. And we got to ask ourselves what we're going to do about it. 
uh, when the resources aren't going to be there to the degree that we would like them to be there. And if uh, personal and professional growth is what it takes uh, and what occurs when we stretch our comfort zones, you know, how can we encourage such, such growth to continue at a time when the tendency, uh, given the circumstances that surround us, will be to hunker down? Uh, not take those risky assignments, uh, not take the risk of the new job in a new location, not apply for schooling not knowing where, you, where the Army's going to send you after that school, uh, not take the broadening assignments or the developmental assignments, not take time for mentoring because you're focused on yourself and survival and, 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 and continuing to work, and not signing up for great programs like the SEDEM program that I hope you, you'll take advantage of uh, picking up the literature outside. Uh, our new civilians, uh, the, the, the new millennials, so to speak, they're probably less likely to make the Army or any institution a career. Uh, and so how do we challenge them and help them and encourage them to grow uh, and then perhaps entice them to stay longer than they would otherwise have thought they were going to do at the outset? Um, in, in closing, I just want to say that you know, every single one of us, every one of us is irreplaceable. But I, I, I cannot help think that being considered or char being characterized as non-essential has had a detrimental effect uh, and uh, a pervasive one on how Army civilians, how public servants everywhere view their work, view their profession, and view their role in the Army and, and, and uh, in federal service. Um, when we furlough career professionals, we diminish their professionalism. When we stop incentivizing excellent performance, we start incentivizing mediocrity. When we freeze compensation and incentive pay, we freeze the desire to do what it takes instead of uh, the minimum required. When we stop honoring public service for the noble profession it really is, we deter honorable citizens from considering such service, and we degrade the morale of those who should be so very proud of their service to their country. So I would say uh, in closing that it's time for us to speak much more loudly on behalf of Army civilians and public servants everywhere. We need to let everyone know uh, the country is extraordinarily well served. They are getting their money's worth. They're getting more than their money's worth. We need to work harder to help everybody understand just how much the best Army in the world needs the best civilians to support it. And we need to do everything possible to keep the best civilians from joining our great team. We need to recognize the risks these times pose to innovation and workforce development and find ways, perhaps new ways, to, to counter it. And we've got to vow. We really have to vow in the Army never to make the mistake of furloughing our, our great civilian professionals again. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for, uh, for your comments. Um, I think here's what we're going to do. We, we had some time limitations because of our uh, shortened start. So um, uh, John Bostic, John Ferreter, uh, John, thank you very much for coming. Um, we, we have some questions from you. We will make sure we work with your staff to get some answers or comments back to some of those um, when we have them because we have another panel and then we have to get out of here because they got to set it up for something else. So please give a round of applause to our first panel. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to start here in a couple minutes when we switch out. People on this panel are adaptable because I just told them that we're going to forgive what they were going to say to start up, and they're going to answer the questions that you had for the group before. <laughs> How's that? Pretty novel idea, isn't it? Well, as it turns out, you know, both panels, there, there were some different topics they were going to have, but the questions that you have are very pertinent to what they were going to say anyway because they were up here listening. They were listening. They told me the same. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we have some questions to start out, but let me introduce our panel here. The topic was, well, it was Open Mic was the name of the um, – of this particular panel, open mic, a discussion of current issues impacting Army civilians. Duh. Okay, so we have a lot of issues concerning Army civilians from the previous panel, but also that these particular experts who I'll introduce right now can answer. First, we have Mr. Jay Aronowitz, Assistant G1 for the Civilian Personnel Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for G1. We have Mr. Tony Stamilio, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, Civilian Personnel and Quality of Life. 
We have Ms. Barbara Panther, Director of the Civilian Human Resources Agency, and we have Ms. Vicki Brown, Chief Civilian Training and Leader Development Division, G357 Training Directorate. Let's give them all a round of applause. Okay, I'm going to start out um, with a question because I'm the chair. And, uh, and then you, you all, we ha you have some questions you've gotten. And then please, um, as you have more questions based on you know what these people do, if you have a question of them, please pass them up to the center here and Barbara and Tony will pick them up. But um, I'm going to continue on with something that kind of came up. Um, we at Coca-Cola just went into uh, last year uh, training with industry with a military member. We have a, a, a major from the Acquisition Corps who we brought on last year. He got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and he went back to work. And now we have a Lieutenant Colonel who works in our contracting section, our product supply section, who is now working at Coca-Cola, those two military people. So what can we do with civilians maybe, training with industry? How do you feel about that? What do we have to do to make that happen? So. I, I think that's pretty light action. We can uh, do in uh, uh, a, a couple of things. I, th I think we can take advantage of, uh, of a training with industry opportunity. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Get the microphone. Now you go. You're good. Now. Okay. I, I think we can take advantage of it and, and shape it in a way that will be mutually beneficial for uh, uh, for Coke or any other organization. Mm -hmm. And, and fits in with with what we're trying to do with leader development. Okay. And I'd like to add that all of the career program managers have an opportunity to do training with industry. Generally, it's included <coughs> in their ITEDS training plans. But I'd like to take it another step further, and not only do we send our Department of Army civilians out to train with industry, but then we bring those industry members back in to backfill that position. And so there is no void in the workload. And so both of them are gaining and learning from being on a low-cost developmental assignment, generally within the same geographical area. There's no travel. There's no per diem. And so then both organizations will benefit. So that's something that few of our career programs do, but we don't maximize that to the greatest extent that we can. Okay, so why don't we do this, because you all have some questions I think that Tony has given you, so I'll just let you pick what you, you think, and I'm going to just go one, one at a time across. So Jay, why don't you start? Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, we're hearing rumors that resources to support the Army intern program are on the decline. Uh, this historic program provides Army the seed corn for future Army civilian leaders. Please explain why the potential uh, decrease. Um, the, the fact of the matter is in, in the program objective memorandum of the POM, the uh, authorizations for civilians uh, are going down from about 1,200 to, uh, to around 800 or so, uh, a reduction uh, of about, uh, about 33 um, percent. This really is all about uh, the budget. Uh, and the program dollars. Uh, I can tell you that nearly every senior leader that I talk to um, understands how important uh, the intern program is. I know that uh, it was mentioned that John uh, Nerger uh, was a product of the, of the intern program. Uh, I was an Army intern uh, 32 years ago uh, this summer uh, with, uh, without any intention of ever uh, making the federal government a career. And here I am 32 years later, and I know that as I look across the front row, uh, I see many other former Army uh, interns. So uh, senior leaders understand how important the program is. Uh, my staff uh, was fortunate enough to brief the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army uh, last week on how to manage civilians during a drawdown environment. Um, and he, as well as some of the senior leaders that you heard up here at the earlier panel, are concerned about how to protect those individuals who are new to government. And I know we've got to be careful and not say younger uh, workforce, but those individuals who really are, are new to government. Uh, and the chief ha has really challenged uh, uh, General Bromberg and, and myself in working with Tony Stamilio and Mr. Schneider uh, and looking at the feasibility of developing some uh, ULBs uh, in order to um, craft uh, congressional uh, language uh, that will look at how to better uh, protect these uh, individuals who are new to government. Um, we are looking at other options with regards to um, how the program is either centrally managed or decentrally managed. Uh, we've worked with commands and coming up with, I think, a very viable option that will continue to be uh, centrally managed. Um, I know that uh, we talked briefly uh, about civilian workforce transformation in some of the earlier sessions, and it was referenced uh, up here uh, today. Uh, we have stood up 
eight new career programs, 31 career programs altogether. Um, uh, under the UNDERS auspices, uh, we are fully resourcing those uh, career programs. And those career programs and, and functional chief representatives are going to be critical in order, in, order to in order to send the demand signal for what, uh, what the Army needs with regard to interns. Um, and, and again, uh, after coming out of uh, 10 years of war, uh, we've done this before where we've been on a decline. Um, we are going to continue on this path for, uh, for a number of years. Um, and then uh, over time, I think, as we start to look at the out, uh, out years of the POM going into 1520 and 1621, uh, we can start to build back the uh, intern program to a, a number that I think is sustainable. But again, it's dependent upon the career program management offices and the FCRs to send the, the demand signal to Army leadership for what the uh, intern requirements are. Cool. Thanks. Jeff. Tom. Yeah, the question I have is, uh, which way is the pendulum swinging between Army civilians and contractors? And uh, for, for those of you who uh, have been around for a while, you recall that uh, there was uh, uh, moves in the past toward uh, more outsourcing and then moves uh, in the recent past toward, uh, toward insourcing. And so which way is it going to go in the future? And I, and I guess what I would tell you is uh, the pendulum is swinging in a more rational direction now. And by that, I mean uh, what uh, we are asking commands to, to focus on uh, is not, <coughs> excuse me, how much insourcing or how much outsourcing, but what is the right mixture of labor to do the work that has to be done. Uh, and uh, that right mixture of labor has to be uh, uh, looked at in terms of what is the work? Is it short term? Is it long term? Is it something that's inherently governmental? or closely associated with that, is it something that, that we really need to have the skills in-house in to do uh, and what's the best use of our dollars uh, in terms of uh, should it be uh, civilian salaries or should it be contractors given the relative cost of each. And so <clears throat> in, the, in the FY14 and, and in the coming years, uh, that's how commands are going to be structuring uh, their approach to uh, to labor and their approach to uh, how many civilians versus how many contractors. And so uh, I, uh, I don't know what the numbers are going to be. Uh, they're going to be smaller uh, on all accounts uh, because the, uh, the dollars are, are going down. But uh, uh, at, at the end of the day, we'll have the opportunity to, to be able to explain to ourselves, here's why we chose uh, to accomplish this task. Uh, with civilians and to accomplish this task with uh, with contractors so that in the future we can be uh, building out a workforce uh, that matches the needs that we have based on the work to be done now and the work to be done in the future. So uh, that's a, a long answer to a uh, uh, short question, but the bottom line answer is a rational direction. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Tony. Barbara. Good morning. Um, I'd like to answer one of three questions that were on this, so I need to commend the writer that they are very aware of saving money and paper <laughs> and so forth. I thank you. Uh, the first question has to do with how for very technical fields, scientists, engineers, medical professions and so forth, so forth, how the human resources staff may not have um, as much information as they need in order to determine who should be referred on a candidate list. So, and, and the question is always, how can the HR folks know as much as the technical folks? And it's certainly legitimate. We have been working for the past several months on developing a pilot program that would allow the uh, hiring entity to identify a panel of subject matter experts that would take those candidates for a job who meet the basic qualifications. They have the right degree, they have the right um, time and grade, so forth and so on. And those subject matter experts from the command would then go through a structured process of identifying who is the best qualified of those candidates. Um, this is very familiar to those of us who've been around for a long time. It harkens back to what we used to do. But we are finding that there's a lot of call for this. So if the writer of this um, question would like to talk offline, we'll be glad to engage with them and see if they'd like to be part of the pilot project and see if, in fact, we can determine whether or not the the process that's been proposed is going to provide better quality candidates for managers to consider. Um, the, la the other two questions have to do with leadership development, and I'm going to ask 
Vicki Brown to answer one of them. But the question about this particular scientist, and many of us feel the same way whenever we're in a leadership position or in a very heavy workload. You don't have time to go out for leader development. And that makes it very difficult. You really do feel challenged with finding the time to get away from the office. And I'd like to share with you what the senior executive speaker this morning shared. And that individual is Lieutenant General retired Jim Campbell. And his comment and advice to all of us in the senior executive world is developed out of his experience in coaching and mentoring and talking with general officers in the Army. And the answer is that you have to take time. You have to make time. If leadership development is important, there's no other way to do it other than to take the time out of your calendar. If it's not something that you want to engage in by taking the time, then perhaps your technical path is what you're most interested in doing. And that's great. That's good. We need those technical experts. General Campbell advised all of us who were in the room to take a hold of our calendars, to block out time for strategic thinking, personal assessment, personal development, leadership development. And so that's a decision that we're going to all struggle with as we go forward with trying to figure out how to fit everything into the days and the hours that we have available. But there may be other options as well. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki Brown. Since I haven't had a chance to read this question, I'm going to answer the question that I want to answer first, and then I'll answer this one. So the question that was asked to me when we walked in the front door is, why are we moving to Go Army Ed? And what's the benefit of it, and what does it do for us as Department of Army civilians? And so first of all, the reason that we have moved to Go Army Ed is to develop and provide for the Army an enterprise-based training management system. The one thing that I cannot tell my leadership is, what are we doing to develop our Department of Army civilians across the Army enterprise? We know those individuals that we manage from a central perspective for career programs, but what are we doing for our commands? And so the goal of Go Army Ed is that we have an enterprise system that's integrated with some of the larger systems that are out there so that we can pull information at a moment's notice to respond to our leadership as well as to OSD and to Congress. But the bottom line is that we will have a centralized system for SF-182s, that they will all be registered in Go Army Ed. All of that will then automatically be auto-populated into your personnel file. And the biggest challenge that we're having now is the training is not getting from completion into personnel files, and so you're not able to track and see where you are and what you've done. And so one way that we're going to help do that is with developing and deploying Go Army Ed. Now the system did deploy on the 30th of September, and on the 1st of October you know that the government shut down. And so there's been a lack of communication between the time the system deployed and where we are today. And so 30 days later we're still trying to play catch up to make sure that we get information out there, not only to our career program managers, but also to our training managers in each of our 26 training commands. And so you'll see back on the back tables that there are robust informations for supervisors, for employees, for career program managers and training managers. And there's also going to be training at the end of the month and 1st of November. And so really, Go Army Ed is designed to provide that enterprise perspective for training and management so we can answer the question, what are we doing and who are we training with the limited training resources that we have across the Army? That was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Jay, over to you again. Um, I, I apparently didn't answer this question well enough last year. Um, <laughs> so the question is, uh, why are um, all the military retirees getting uh, supervisory jobs and, and, and promotions? Um, I, I don't know that that clap indicated that that was the individual who asked the question last year, didn't like the answer, and has come back again. But um, actually, when I say it's a timely uh, question, uh, my, my predecessor, uh, Dr. Susan Duncan, uh, started a um, study um, before I came on board as the assistant G1 for civilian personnel called uh, the Green Ceiling, um, which uh, the intention was to, to look at whether or not there is a green ceiling where um, uh, individuals like myself who uh, have no prior military service uh, end up hitting a ceiling at around the GS 11, 12, 13 level, depending on, on where you're at um, 
both within your, your career field and, and geographic location. Uh, and the study was to look at the, um, the attitudes and opinions of uh, civilian employees. So they went out and uh, interviewed several hundred uh, individuals at uh, several locations in several different career fields um, and asked the question, you know, have you personally experienced uh, not being selected uh, for a position or a promotion that you felt you were better qualified for by someone uh, with a prior military service and, and questions of that nature uh, and, and collected the, the data and uh, we also pulled together a lot of historical data and um, within about the last week uh, we published what I'm calling volume one of the green ceiling study uh, and we'll send it out through all the command uh, G1 channels uh, to, to the workforce, both civilian and, and military. Um, and, and I will tell you that a, as an old data guy, um, there initially uh, doesn't seem to be anything very alarming in the data. In other words, uh, it's not like we're seeing that um, uh, prior military service uh, individuals represent only 15% of GS-15s but hold 80% of the supervisory jobs. I mean, we're not seeing things of that nature. So uh, the data is what the data is. Um, we continue to analyze it and look at it. Um, and it really dovetails well with the discussion we had with uh, General Odierno uh, last week in, in terms of how do we continue to shape and manage the civilian workforce in a drawdown. Um, I think most of you all know what the uh, RIF uh, retention rules are uh, with regard to how folks are, are categorized and obviously being prior military uh, puts you in a uh, category much higher than those without military, prior military service and so we're going to have to work our way through that. Uh, next year uh, we uh, hope to publish volume two of the green ceiling study and what we're going to look at uh, are the selection patterns of supervisors looking at both supervisors who have prior military service uh, and those who don't have prior military service, again, to see if there's any patterns with regard to who they are selecting. We also want to take uh, some cohort groups of individuals who come in at a certain period of time and look at promotion patterns. So as an example, if I have a cohort group of GS9s uh, and I can uh, distinguish between those with prior military service and those without prior military service, what is the arc of the trajectory of their promotion? and we can track that uh, over time. So I think that's going to give us some uh, great insight. And we'll continue to work with the commands just in terms of making sure that we're asking the right questions uh, as, we, as we really uh, evolve this, uh, this project over time. Because again, I think it's critical that we, uh, that we do ask the right questions. So really, what is the Army doing about this? Uh, I have to tell you that having sat in several senior leadership forums uh, this week, I have not heard the word civilians come out of so many senior leaders' mouth um, in all of the eight USAs that I have been at. Um, and, and so I'm glad to say that I think the third leg of the stool is being put in place with regard to soldiers, family members, and civilians. And it is a three-legged stool, so to speak. And without any of those legs um, being both ready and resilient, uh, the Army uh, mission and readiness is always going to be, uh, be at risk. So again, I'm uh, heartened to see all the senior leaders talking about uh, how important civilians are. I have to tell you, um, uh, you know, Mr. Schneider mentioned in the earlier session, one of the unintended consequences, I think, of this furlough, uh, we had a lot of commanders who probably didn't appreciate us as much as they should have. Uh, and as civilians were being furloughed uh, and there was no one to operate, the ranges. Uh, there was no one to haul ammunition out of the ammunition storage point. Uh, there was no one to uh, set up or fix the simulator. Um, soldiers were in garrison and were not training and doing what soldiers should be doing in, in garrison. And so one of the unintended consequences, I think, um, men and women in uniform, at least in the field, I believe have a much better appreciation of how critical and important civilians uh, are. Um, the, the Army has the Army Leader Development Strategy and Army uh, Leader Development Forum that's chaired by uh, TRADOC. Um, civilians uh, are uh, front and center within both the strategy and, and the forum. Uh, we have a guest speaker at the lunch today. I hope that many of you all are going to join us, uh, General Cohen, Commander TRADOC, and, and he and the under could not be uh, better proponents for the civilian workforce over the last couple of years and, and going forward. Uh, and we also talked a little bit earlier about the Senior Executive Talent Management Program, CEDAM. Um, this is really a critical uh, program to grow our future leaders. Um, I, I can't remember what the statistics were, but um, two years ago, 
the applications for, for CEDAM uh, were very, very small. Uh, and uh, this year uh, alone, there were several hundred applications, and it takes folks like those up here on the panel and you out uh, in the audience who are supervisors to really reach out uh, and encourage and press your uh, employees, I mean, those with high potential to uh, participate in these programs. Because again, uh, five to 10 years from now, you and they are gonna be the ones sitting up here uh, at, uh, at the table and, and not folks like uh, Jay Aronowitz. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Tom. How much time do we have? We get this uh, last question. Okay, I'm not gonna answer a question. I'm gonna give, give out an assignment. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's uh, in, in part a uh, response to, uh, to what uh, John Nurger talked about. Certainly it's been a, uh, uh, a difficult year for, for our civilian corps and uh, uh, we are all committed to, to try to uh, not live the, live the past again. Uh, the facts are, though, that, that we're going to get uh, smaller as, a, as an army of uh, all, all components, and, uh, and we, need to, uh, uh, we need to recognize that. But uh, as, as uh, Jay mentioned, uh, I think that <clears throat> we have got uh, the, the commitment of the senior leadership of the Army not just to not do furloughs again, uh, but, the, but the commitment of uh, that senior leadership and the, and the belief that uh, uh, the the civilian corps is a critical component of the of the army profession, but attendant to that, it has some responsibilities, uh, and uh, those those responsibilities re, uh, it fall into into our lap to uh, to produce as we have uh, not only on the job but but in terms of uh, the stewardship of the profession and the development of our uh, uh, leaders now and leaders in the future. So, so the assignments that, that I would give you uh, are the following. Uh, number one, uh, listen to the Secretary of the Army's keynote speech for, for AUSA. Uh, it was worthwhile because he really set the tone of, uh, of uh, uh, where the Army is, where the Army's going, and some of the challenges that, uh, that we had. And he probably, no, nah, not probably, he can't say things the way John Nerger said them this morning here. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it's it's obvious that he recognizes what uh, uh, what is going on and is committed to, to fix it. Number two, uh, get a hold of uh, the CSA strategic priorities, October 2013. Uh, you will see, uh, as uh, Jay talked about, ourselves as a civilian corps uh, in this document, and it sets the stage for where the chief wants to take the army. Uh, inherent in that are a couple of things, one being leader development uh, and leader development challenges. And, and so it, this is not, I sat in the leader development forum yesterday where uh, the, the chief and General Cohn and other senior leaders talked about where leader development is going uh, across the Army, and, and it wasn't an optional thing. So one of the questions that, uh, that I was supposed to answer is, uh, what do you do in a high op-tempo uh, organization? Uh, it, the, the chief is personally committed to this. He's personally chairing uh, some uh, leader forums, uh, and all of the general officers that, that were sitting in that room uh, got got the message. He wasn't stuttering. It, it's take the time uh, to be mentors. Take the time uh, to develop leaders. It's take the time and invest the time in people, even if that means that you're going to be uh, short someplace else for a while because the long-term investment is huge. The third assignment is uh, I would ask you to dig into uh, just a little bit, you don't have to dig real hard, uh, into two of the Army's doctrinal publications uh, that have just been released. They've been on the street for a year. First one is called ADP-1, Army Doc Doctrinal Publication 1, The Army. Uh, if, if you don't think that we are a relevant core, page 2 is the Army Civilian Creed. We are scattered in this uh, in this document in significant places where it talks about the Army profession and, and the critical pieces of uh, uh, the Army profession, those being two mutually supportive components of the profession of arms, that uniform uh, component in the, uh, in the Army Civilian Corps and our mutually supportive uh, requirements and, <clears throat> and contributions uh, to make the Army profession a whole. Uh, the second document is ADP number 6-22, Army Leadership. It says what we have to do. 
it doesn't say what soldiers have to do what the uniform leadership has to do develop leaders it says what the leadership requirements are in terms of developing leaders and it applies to to both cohorts and so we're going to work the budgets and we're going to work our butts off to try never to have to do this furlough business again we are going to do some some reshaping and and the the commands and and Jay's team and and mine and Barbara's are all all committed to doing this as smart as we can so that as General Ferreter was successful last year and not having to involuntarily release people we're going to work hard to not make that make that happen it's going to happen in some cases but it's it's up to us to to try and minimize that but it's up to the the entire Corps to continue to to serve continue to support the Army and and recognize it's difficult after this year but have faith that that the senior army leadership knows appreciates and fully supports us and is is looking forward to more important is relying on us to deliver what what we have over the last many years to to support the army so thanks for your time thank you okay um I don't know about you all but uh I'm excited of of what I heard today uh from General V to start your vice start um the first panel um the adaptiveness of this panel to answer the questions which you know I kind of like the forum actually um getting questions from you not that I don't like hearing the people speak but also getting the questions from all of you out there which is what we want to do um I I think it was said I forgot who said it during the day uh but something like this quote that I've heard in a time of crisis you find opportunity I think that's what Tony was trying to sum up here at the end um I also recall General Shinseki at one point in his speech here at AUSA a few years ago saying you can't roll up your sleeve what how's it go you can't um wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time you know it's time to 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 roll up our sleeves um because I know while I've retired I'm still in the business and I'm still coming here and I still value being myself a, a army civilian and I know you do too and so there's a lot going on there's a lot going to continue to go on and we're still going to be great army civilians who who all right so thank you all very much Let's give a hand to this panel appreciate you being adaptable thank you very much my good friend Jay <laughs> and ever and uh, so uh, we're going to break now. If you have a ticket for the civilian luncheon, it will start at noon. Um, and, and also, I'm going to give, uh, as a token of appreciation, this wonderful, highly coveted book to our members. Thank you all very much, and see you next year.